Okay, I'm live. I just arrived at the Kalanimoku building. Downtown Honolulu. I forgot my hot spot, so the quality probably won't be uh, very good. I'm uh, broadcasting using my AT&T uh, cell data. Uh, passing by, there are a large number of uh, protesters, conspicuously uh, local five, red shirts. There's something going on. Out here, I think they may be broadcasting it from inside to outside. I'm going to try and get inside for you guys. I'm going to try and sign in for someone here. The notice of today's public hearing appeared uh, in the November 12, uh, 2012 edition of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. And uh, this is in a compliance with Chapter 91 uh, on public hearing. The purpose of this public hearing is to give the public an opportunity to express views and opinions on PODC's proposed Hawaii Administrative Rules, Chapters 13-301, Rules of Practice and Procedure, and Chapter 13. 13-3 Olelo is live streaming Public from development program. Channel now, 55. Public hearing and rule not be answering any questions at this time. Testimony is to be specific on chapters 301 and 302. I, I, I do want to ask all of you here uh, to be respectful of all others uh, that will be testifying here in the audience. So with that, I'd uh, like to start the, the testimony. <coughs> That will pull out the first, a couple of names. Thank you. Uh, Dino Kimoto, and then uh, Mike Simon on the other side. Please state your name before giving your testimony. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Dino Kimoto. I am uh, President of the Hawaii Farm Bureau Federation and also a farmer, President of Nalo Farm Center. I'm here today to uh, testify in support of uh, uh, the, the administrative rules, chapter 13, 302, 301, and 13, 302. First, I'd like to say that I believe the PLDC is an entity that can do much good for the state of Hawaii. I think we must give it a chance to see what types of projects for the benefits of our citizens of the state of Hawaii can be uh, derived from this entity. The state should look at everything to drive our economy forward, especially when it can help the people of this state. Of course, we agree that because this is a public land and public must have a process to get the projects within communities, um, uh, that's in place. And I believe that's part of the changes in here. The state should look at everything to drive our economy forward. Um, a good example of the type of projects that are um, for, for uh, I'm looking at it from the point of view of agriculture and what good uh, uh, in terms of driving um, our sustainability initiatives that the governor has said. Um, and one of the things that for years we've been trying to get is a biosecurity facility at the airports where we can monitor the basic species coming into our communities. I think, um, you know, the state doesn't have the money to do it. We've been looking at this for years. Every year we deal with as, as agriculture, as community, as environment, um, about 20 new invasive species on average per year. Um, by having a public-private partnership to build these facilities, I feel that we can mitigate a lot of these problems and not have the problems not only for agriculture, but uh, for the environment um, that we deal with and, and even community with, with pokey problems. So, you know, if, if guys are willing to invest in, in these facilities, I think we can increase our food sustainability going forward. And it is a major problem for us to deal with at all times. Another part for agriculture that we, we always um, have tended to be behind the mainland is having value-added facilities where uh, farmers are able to take their seconds and, and produce other products such as ketchup dressing, and all of these types of things to be competitive and bring down prices of our 
of our fruits and vegetables, we do need these facilities to mitigate and help us to move the industry forward and make farming viable for, for our farmers. Um, you know, the other thing that I'm also on the early, early uh, beginning board, which is looking at the problem of early childhood education. Uh, I do believe that these types of things need to be moved at existing facilities where we can retrofit for uh, preschoolers to go and we have, the, you know, we have state facilities to do it. We need to do these things, especially with, with private um, input. Thank you. Let me just uh, remind you all, and I forgot to mention that uh, the each testify will have approximately three minutes, and depending on the amount of uh, people that have uh, signed up for testimony, we will play it by ear. But thank you. A lot of board members. My name is uh, Michael Kumuka Ali, and I have a letter to read from uh, myself and Hank Bergstrom of Haleo Kiabi regarding the Public Land Development Corporation. On September 20, 2012, Nafukuna Moku Okiyabe sent to you in public testimony the exact language clarifying that there are only five declared beneficiaries to the Ceded Lands Trust as defined in Section 5F of the, of the Admissions Act. Such land proceedings and income shall be managed and disposed of for one of the uh, foregoing purposes in such manner as a constitution uh, and law of said state may provide, and their use of any other object shall constitute a breach of trust for which a suit may be brought by the United States. The Admissions Act in the Federal Public Trust created a federally enforceable right for beneficiaries to maintain action against the trustees. Plaintiff's 42 U.S.C. 1983 action thus proper 3F3D1220 period. The state's creation of the Public Land Development Corporation is a contravention by law. The state of Hawaii is a trustee of the 5F trust land and cannot simply bequeath the trust obligations to a third party, PLDC without being in breach of said trust. The testimony, public, private, deprives the public of assets, lands, proceeds, and income by the inclusion of, quote unquote, private parties as trust beneficiaries. Therefore, the public is subjected to unintended consequences, such as suits that may result from Failed agreements of the PLDC has already entered into with private parties. We have attached our testimony since on September 20th, 2010, and hereby give you a second judicial notice of breach of trust. Respectfully yours, Hank Ferguson and Michael Kumukau Okami. My name is Lance Ha'ililike, Ku Mo'ali, direct descendant of Kamehameha One. I am Makiki Ohawai Lahu. I have a very big problem with the PLDC team. PLDC was not created for the people, by the people. I'm suspicious of this group, PLDC. We all have to follow the law, even the government. The Corporation Council and the Beguiling has proposed on two of my family property, the High Indian Estate, three years ago because of old land taxes and still has not given my family the money for this land sale, which is way over what our family owed on our land taxes. Now, you see why I have a problem with this corporation that you have created, the governor has created here. They already have a corporation here stealing from our people. 
know, today it seems like, excuse me to all the white people here, but the same thing is happening to my people that happened to our queen back in 1893 as we speak. Very, what, very rich, white, white, rich businessmen in the other family and friends. They are still in our land once again and selling us out. And we need to stop this kind of thing. And not just help the Hawaiian people, for all of the people that live here in the city of Hawaii that made this group island in their home, we should be inclusive and not exclusive. Mm -hmm. That's all I have to say. This is um, Fumi Bonk right here from the Big Island. Uh, Fumi Bonk is from uh, originally from Hilo, but she lives in Kamuela now, and she's my mother, and she's asked me to come up here and speak for her and told me what to say. She, um, she's been getting calls from the Big Island uh, a lot this week, uh, including a call from Moani Ke'ala Okaka, a former uh, OHA trustee for 12 years. Moani was the trustee for, the Hawaii, for Hawaii Island. And to go on record, um, both my mother and Moani Ke'ala Okaka want to go on record uh, informing the PLDC that they uh, went back on their promise to have hearings on the Big Island after they made changes to the rules and regulations for the PLDC. They had promised the Big Island people that they would be back to have a public hearing, and they feel slighted that you didn't go back to do that, and you're doing it on the Oahu so that the people of the outer islands do not have a fair um, opportunity to comment on, on this body, this corporation. So um, I brought with it to put on record um, an article that uh, Moana Keala Kaka has written on the PLBC in her um, uh, newspaper called Aloha Aina, and I'll present that to you. Um, she has already stated why she's opposed to this, and my mother and father, who is uh, deceased, have spent their whole entire lives, not just on the Big Island, but through the state, working for cultural preservation and archaeological preservation of Hawaiian artifacts and, and um, uh, history. My father serves on the DLNR board for historical sites preservation, and if he was alive today, he'd be appalled at this whole um, circuit. Um, my mother came today to represent him and his philosophy on good public planning and on good um, conservation of the environment, but in particular, their work to preserve the history of Hawaii. This goes against every process that we have in place in Hawaii. And you know, um, I, I'm Sorry to say that um, the creation of Act 55 was just encouraged by many developers who have other private interests in contributing large sums of money to our public officials to do projects, special projects to them. Moani and my mother wanted to assert the fact that there have been large, a lot of fights on the Big Island with developers coming in and wanting to um, fast track development without the public's participation. One in particular that they know has been earmarked for this particular corporation's uh, agenda is Honokahau. The project in Honokahau has been boycotted and fought for many, many decades. The people have spoken, they don't want it. And here you come with another little developer um, plot and scheme to force it back into their face. They have a lot of better things to do on the Big Island, like community-based economic development projects that are going on all around that island. If you really want to help, eliminate this, put all the funds into communities, and let them decide what they want to do. And that's coming from the Big Island. That's, um, that's about it. Mom, do you have anything else to say? Sheldon Zane, um, president of Zane and Associates. I am here today to strongly support 
uh, not only the Public Land Development Corporation, but also the adoption of its administrative rules, which is, I believe, specifically the purpose of this hearing. Uh, I come from 20 years of experience in public-private partnerships. Uh, I've seen it work successfully at the national level, being involved with Army and Navy military private housing. Uh, I've been involved in um, the city and county with probably the largest public-private venture done to date, the uh, development of Westlock Estates and Westlock Ferries, and today's uh, project value of an excess of a half billion dollars. Um, but my biggest uh, disappointment has been, although I've been selected as a private developer for two university projects, uh, they never came to fruition. Uh, one was the uh, Fear Hall Dormitory, which was um, then morphed into a uh, design-build contract, which the state eventually paid for instead of having a private developer pay for it. Uh, the other one was the development of two community college campuses on the Big Island, which I'm, where I'm from, uh, which was not uh, uh, endorsed by the governor and the land never released to those developments. Now, all the projects I've been involved in have been master planned and already uh, designated as development sites. So, you know, I think a lot of the concern is developing um, properties uh, that may have higher value as uh, cultural and other sites, but that has not been the experience in my case. Uh, these sites have been long planned for development, specifically for educational and other uses. Um, my reason for testifying is I don't have a pro uh, vested interest in any of this. I don't intend to be a developer. I just feel that my experience and my associates who have been involved in the sole consultant advising the Army and Navy on the military housing project. Uh, another associate is the University Financing Foundation that was formed to assist Georgia Tech University and now provides assistance to development and filling of research parks throughout the country. Um, I also have local associates associated with me, long recognized and, and respected companies including planning and design by Wilchie and Associates, civil engineering and surveying by R.M. Powell, and architectural work by um, Urban Associates, who has done a multitude of um, public buildings. Uh, my interest really in the future uh, is really in having PLDC succeed and provide to the state the requirements that are critically needed to support our aging infrastructure. If we don't have uh, methods of financing our public infrastructure and capital improvements, uh, we're going to be faced with a, a, a crumbling infrastructure. Um, with respect to the two sections of the rules, I have prepared uh, some comments and suggestions uh, which I will leave with uh, the board. Uh, in summary, uh, as they say in Navy football, I think we ought to proceed at full speed in adopting the administrative rules. Um, that, that's the end of my testimony. Uh, before you start, okay. let me just uh, remind again, maybe some of you uh, came a little later, but this is a public hearing on the rules, and you know, we should be specifically on the rules. Uh, I would appreciate that. And it, it being respectful to others uh, that are here today, you know. Uh, uh, Please, no applause or, or uh, excessive, you know, uh, noise or, or, or applauding by uh, the crowd would be much appreciated. Thank you. Aloha, Chair uh, Haraguchi, <laughs> members of the PLDC staff, and um, well, the committee members. Um, I'm here today to not support the rules and regulations of the PLDC going forth or any other action going forth on the PLDC, um, to postpone any action on the PLDC until the repeal of the PLDC is done in the next legislative session. The state and counties of Hawaii have public processes in place to do everything the developers who created this organization want to do. The PLDC is an insult to our democracy. The people of Hawaii have not been informed of this public process that is taking place right now, or any of the other um, intents of the PLDC to, quote, exempt 
from uh, all statutes, ordinances, charter provisions, and rules of any government agency, the development of public lands. The people of Hawaii do not know this is going on, and they do not know that there is an attempt to privatize the sale of their public resource, natural resources. If they knew and were given the proper information ahead of time in a democratic way, they would be here today outraged as all of these people are and who are able to come on a work day at 10.30 in the morning. The people of Hawaii do not work for LERF and the other developer organizations that will probably speak for the, the PLDC. There are so many conflicts of interest in this establishment of this PLDC. I had to actually expose two times, two hearings, these conflicts of interest. And today, since I didn't have a chance last time, I will continue. You, Mr. Hardwood, you, for instance, worked for most of your life for a large land development company called James Campbell Estate. For 25 years, you worked for this organization. And other staff people, like Randy Ikeda, was hired to work for Dwayne Carisu, who is also on the board of this organization as the one out of two public members that we have. Randy worked as one of uh, Dwayne Carisu's chief operating officers for AIO, the, the, the media arm of Dwayne Carisu's um, corporation who hold, who brand and spin anything they want consumers to buy. Dwayne also is the multi-tiered uh, corporate head of Carisu and Fergus, one of the largest real estate development corporations and speculative developers in Hawaii. Now these are the people of a five member board with a couple staff that you want the people of Hawaii to be, have confidence in developing our public lands. I don't know about you, but I don't trust this whole uh, setup. To put a developer, his, his hired people for 15 years, Randy worked for him, a developer for James Campbell Estate that has interest in the PLDC development, and um, for you know a politician who is able to do all the work for the private corporation because he's retired from the Senate. Okay, there we go. I'm going to have to continue this at another meeting, <laughs> obviously. But, you know, putting all the, the I'll sum up, putting all these um, little dots together for it to public is going to take a while. And they're not, not informed. They're just not informed. You haven't sufficiently informed them, and there's going to be a lot of legal problems due to this. And you just can't rip off the people's public resources and get away with it. Mahalo. <laughs> Aloha, members of PLDC. One of the issues that is always raised at public hearings is whether you have already made the decision and this is all a smokescreen, or whether you're actually listening to what we have to say. So, specifically, HAR 13-301-6 says the presiding officer may set time limits and may restrict testimony to what is germane to the issue. We are discussing whether we should adopt those <coughs> as rules. And yet, we were told at this meeting that we must obey that. That the time limit and speaking to what is germane to the issue is being imposed on the speakers and we're supposed to be telling you whether those should be wise to adopt in the first place. So it sounds like you've already made the decision, since you're li already living by the rules that you want us to discuss. That is stupidity. Um, so, we favor repeal. We've heard from some of the previous testifiers, and we see from the screen up there, that PLDC will enable people to will enable the state to repave parking lots, <coughs> to clean toilets, <coughs> and to build ketchup designing facilities. Now, if you can't do that without the PLDC, <laughs> there is something really wrong with government. So, when a law is passed, you pass it with an intention of doing something. What is really missing from this is what it is you're really trying to do. Not the ketchup making, not the repaving roads, not the cleaning of toilets. For some reason the law was passed. 
and the public deserves the right to know what it is that you're seeking to do. Thank you. Aloha, members of the PLPC. I'm Lily Lani Trask from Indigenous Consultants. I participated in most of the legislative hearings last year and also with the Civic Club review of this and I'm here to now present my testimony requesting further amendments. I wanted to start out by thanking you for including the language I recommended in the last hearing because I was worried about how we were going to protect our burials, our hail, our endemic species of plants, our medicinals, and our trails and access ways, and that is why I recommended language. Thank you for including it. I noticed that you also did not include several recommendations I made, but accepting the nature of the public process, I can live with that. Uh, I am here to uh, make additional testimony in three areas relating to the rules. Uh, in the process of looking at the proposals in the Civic Club process, uh, I came across recommendations that I cannot support. Uh, and I want to use now the exact example of the Hawaiian community I'm working with, who are the homesteaders of Wainanalo. They're right here in the bottom southeastern corner of the Po'olau Poco District. Now, proposed rule changes have been submitted to you saying that whenever a project proceeds in an ahu kua'a, that all cultural practices in the ahu as well as abiding ahu need to be assessed, researched, and thereafter consultation. Now, the Native Hawaiians of the Waimanalo Homestead community own the energy resources upon which their homestead lies. And they have a right to develop those resources for hot house agriculture, which is what they want to do. The proposed language that came in from Jocelyn Doan and others would mean that those homesteads <coughs> couldn't move until they did a resource assessment for all of Kona District, Kona Ahu, which is Honolulu, all the way down to Aina Haina, all of Waimanalo, all the way out to Kareori, Kailua, Kailua Bay, and into portions of Ko'olaumua. For the purpose of trying to see if they can have a hot house agriculture project in Waimanalo, they have to identify every person fishing, worshiping at a hail, collecting flowers, planting taro, and then they have to go and have a consultation with them. Native peoples own these resources and they have a right to address them in an efficient way. These types of proposals are coming in not to facilitate the PLBC, but to delay its work. They do not protect Hawaiian resources or Hawaiian rights and you need to see through it and see what's going on there. Two other proposals I make for your consideration. When I looked at section 13.302.25, the, the, the submittals of the initial project proposals, I see that the language is tracking to the original draft of 2011, which was for one central project. Some projects like energy don't proceed in that way. You have an initial exploration phase. And if it proves up, then you proceed to a development phase. When you're dealing with energy, uh, you have to break it in that way. It's not possible for someone dealing with energy like the homesteaders to come in and show you a plan because they don't know if they have it or not. And if they do have it, maybe it will be sufficient for hothouse agriculture, but maybe it will not. So you need to address that. Secondly, I'm recommending that we consider some changes to the section relating to conflict resolution. I think you might want to take a look at Section 205 under the Land Use Commission. There we have the mediation uh, language, which I think could be useful. However, if you do look at that, I'm recommending a number four be included, and that is picking up the purpose of the PLDC, because the PLDC must show that any development that it undertakes and participates in brings an economic social and environmental benefit to our people and the people of the state of Hawaii. And so I think that that requirement must be added to the criteria that we now have in Section 205. But it's something to think about to expedite time and to save money. Thank you. Mahina uh, Martin. And then 
Raymond Lowell. <coughs> Good morning. My name is Mahina Martin, and I've traveled here today from Maui to testify on the PLDC's draft administrator's rules. Like today, when the PLDC came to Maui for its first public hearing, we were told no questions could be answered. We were greeted at the door with stacks of paper to read and a chance to comment. There was no presentation before, during, or after the public hearing. We got very minimal information. I, like many, many others that were there that night, came just out of curiosity, just because we were wondering what is PLDC and what could it possibly do to our county. I was really interested in finding out more about the structure of PLDC, its intentions, its plan, and how its authority would affect public lands and our community's everyday life. I left that night disappointed, frustrated, and deeply disturbed. Disappointed that the public was not a participant in any authentic, well-intended manner. Frustrated at the shallow attempt to keep the public involved. And very disturbed by the obvious one-way process. The massive turnout at the public hearing held on the Big Island, Kauai, Maui, Molokai, and Oahu should have been enough to demonstrate that follow-up hearings should and must return to the neighbor islands. I cannot begin to express the anger of our community of being left out of direct dialogue with the PLDC through a hearing such as this. Instead, we are told to email, write, mail, fax, or buy a plane ticket to Honolulu to participate. We took time that night, time out of a busy life, away from work, family, our activities to attend, out of fairness, to listen, because it was that important to us. We were told we would continue to be included and that our input was valuable, yet the next time we heard from the PLDC was to find out that instead of returning as expected, the kuleana was on us to come to you if we wanted to participate. Once again, taking time off from work, family, and other activities. Only this time, we paid airfare to come. We used airlines mileage. Points intended for family vacation, not to come here to protect our public land. We are expected to trust a new agency that seems to be unable or unwilling to comprehend the level of value the public places on genuine, good faith community engagement. We are expected to accept decisions that will impact our public lands for decades, long past an administration or two or three. We are expected to tolerate agreements and contracts made outside of competitive bidding that could affect any of Hawaii's 67 state parks, 20 boat harbors, and approximately 600 miles of public access trails. Having said all that, relative to these draft administrative rules, I do want to point out the following, and I would like to go over the three minutes, and I hope you grant that, since I flew here from Maui. On page 302.26, item 7, it talks about community community groups having a summary of comments completed and included in preliminary approval. Why is this optional and not a requirement? And why is it a summary? Page 20226, item 8, there's a description of how land planning activities for the project will be coordinated, coordinated with the county planning departments, but this description should be specific. Is this coordination, a telephone call, a meeting, an email? What are the ramifications? Avoid vagueness. In 302-35, item E, the final project proposal, <coughs> states that it shall contain all of the conditions or restrictions, and this is your word, suggested by the county. Why is it not a requirement and what are the ramifications if these conditions are not met? On page 302-33, item A, it states, quote, an eligible project applicant or project partner shall conduct or participate in at least one public meeting in the county, community, or development plan area to solicit community input on a proposed project. This public meeting shall take place prior to final determination. Why only one? I saw a graph, and you folks have developed a very nice flow chart with lots of, uh, there we go, lots of public nice meeting. looking uh, public meeting icons, but yet I couldn't find a correlation of the four points where it talks about public meetings. I only found one that was required. So the picture says this, but the text says something else. So again, I'm unclear. Since there are no questions asked today, 
I guess that one might not be answered. Additionally, Maui County works hard at creating its own community plans and uses an incredible amount of time. Time is put in by our own planning commissioners, general plan citizen advisory group members, so we can achieve smart growth. Future development ought to be county driven and not state imposed, bypassing local zoning laws put in place by the people of that place should remain a requirement to follow. The way the PLDC arrived at our doorstep passing through the House Senate and signing to law in an unheard of three days, the weak effort it makes to work in partnership with the public, the lump sum characterization of critics as hysterical, drum-banging troublemakers, the use of money intended for land conservation to pay for PLDC salaries for an agency tasked with commercialization initiatives and not conservation efforts, well, it's no wonder that so many of us believe that a rewrite of the administrative rules is not the answer. It's not a rewrite, it's a repeal. So far, the PLDC has heard that some folks want to give it a chance. I would say that the PLDC has had many a chance to meaningfully communicate with the public and earn our trust before it gets full authority to work with our trust. A tremendous amount of people across our islands in Hawaii are at odds with the PLDC, and rather than spending months wrestling with pages and pages and pages of rewritten, reworked administrative rules, vilifying each other, generating negativity in our own communities and government, I honestly think we just need to stop where we are, call it a day, and I'll wrap up, and maybe even a new day in Hawaii, where widespread <coughs> public disapproval and the state will be respected. Finally, when the PLDC came to Maui, we looked for a genuine, sincere partnership. We asked to be kept involved in the loop. We asked that we have, that our questions would be answered. We asked that we make this pono, not koho. We asked on Maui that least of all, you not have public hearings just so you can meet a check mark on your list of things to do. We are neighbor islands, not outer islands. There is no state of Honolulu. Neighbor islands should rank just as important as Oahu. Come back if you continue. You may hear the same message anyway. And again, I ask you to think about not rewriting it or repeating it. Mahalo. Raymond Lowe. And then after Raymond, Kat. Hello. Well, my name is Raymond Lowe. I'm just a circuit on Kiwalo base, and I'll tell you what I think of the speed CLD guys. I have dealt with HCDL guys. They're Honolulu, but it seems like they're doing the same. You guys just the same situation, but on a statewide basis instead of just in Honolulu. And I think that's not fair, because I've seen what happens already in Kiwalo base, and you let a problem go until it gets so bad that we say, oh, let's privatize it. We see that after Kiwalo base. What they're doing now is it's privatized. You can't even put your fishing pole in the line without exactly telling you you're not supposed to be here. We've been here since we were kids, we used to do things like that. And the idea is privatized, okay? There was a surf contest. During the surf contest, we had to tell the people to move their cars, the parents to move their cars because the sheriffs didn't give a ticket. The sheriffs came to get a ticket. 20 minutes later, the sheriff left. Other parents that came for the next heat drop off their kids and parked their cars. They got tickets from a person that said he can give you a ticket. To find out he's a private person and it says send the money to a P.O. box. Now, is that publicly, legally to say, hey, this guy is now in charge of Kiwalo Basin? That's what I'm seeing now. You guys have 20 years of problems and all of a sudden you guys are the magic bullet. I don't see it happening. You have 20 years of kicking the thing down the can. Take a couple of minutes to just relax and figure out what you guys are really doing here. I see something here that's really wrong. And I think the folks within the really guys know it too. It really hurts me to be here. I should be doing my work where I'm supposed to be doing. But I really feel strongly about this thing. I see HDA and Honolulu do this to Kiwalo Basin. We try to stop, you know, the public development of lands, which you folks are trying to do again. You know? There is development, yes. We don't mind. Hey, it's going to come down the road. But smart growth, like this, you know, got to be smart about this and listen to the people. That's what I really wanted to say. Finally, it's just and you go, look at these parks. You folks want us to go to the park. Minikahana, do you have a lifeguard? 
You want to be swimming, but hey, you want to see a nice bathroom, hey, you can't just imagine what kind of bathroom you should get. You know what I mean? Better than a hole in the ground, but I'm trying to tell you folks, you folks want parts, but you guys aren't going to protect the jay pads now. You know? They just haven't been able to on a beach park. You want to have fun? Stay on the grass, stay on the sand. Put it in the water, they can drown. I already pulled in two people every year. I go there and surf. Low tide, they walk to that island. High tide, they try to come back. And two currents coming around, they looking at me and said, oh, there was a life group here before. None of your state parks have life groups. And why? You want you folks telling us that this is going to make have life groups and security. I don't believe you folks. It's just, you know, it seems like a lie to me, but you folks should really listen to the people here in the public. And this development is not right. There is smart development, this is not the answer. Thank you. And then uh, Carlos Detro. Aloha board members, I'm Kat Brady, testifying on behalf of Community Alliance on Prisons. I'm a justice advocate. This is really about justice. It's about justice for the people of Hawaii. Again, we express our indignation at the new revised rules, which basically your know, proposal is to limit public testimony. We've spoken to many attorneys who um, are land use experts, and all of them, and some of the attorneys have even served in the Attorney General's office and represented the LNR in the past. And they said to me, how did this law pass? How could such a law pass? No matter what rules you make, the laws trump it. So this is very scary to us because the wolves are salivating at the door. Oh, look at all those resources in Hawaii. And hmm, this is really interesting. We could make a lot of money. The public is really aware of what's happening. They're aware of the fact that we're putting up, oh, we're going to fix your parks. We're going to you know, do things that are for the public benefit. They know that there's something behind that because all of these things could be done currently under the statutes that we have. So we know that there's something, there's some unseen thing happening and the public is kept out of the loop. Interestingly that um, the executive director talked about PONO and you know the definition of PONO is goodness, morality, moral qualities, correct or pro proper procedure excellence, well-being, prosperity, welfare, duty, moral fitting, proper, right, just, fair, successful, should, ought, must, necessary. Unfortunately, the PLDC has exhibited none of these qualities. So your rules are kind of like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. And believe me, this ship is floundering in the rising tide of public outrage. The only thing that we can suggest is this law has to be repealed and we need to start over and have a full-on public process. Mahalo. And then stop. Hello, my name is Carlos Dutro. I've been on Hawaii Community Radio for 15 years. And it's very easy to talk. It's very scary to get up and talk in public. I uh, flew over with friends from Kauai because I felt this was crucial. Um, I'm surprised because our tiny little radio station studio room is bigger than this room. And how can you have such sweeping changes to the way business is done in the state of Hawaii with limited seating? I'm also amazed and take note that only two board members showed up, and I kind of paraphrase, because we could show up with only two. How could they not show up? This is such sweeping change. Next, with all due respect to Kanaka Maoli, because the Hawaiian issue is going to be forever there until we untangle it, we have this thing called the state constitution. Article 1, Section 21, the power of the state to act in the general welfare shall never be impaired by the making of any irrevocable grant of special privileges or immunities. It's a state constitution. I, I don't know how that was missed. I'm concerned about a group of five people that will have the ability to bypass the political process and the ability
ability to bypass county zoning requirements and possibly even bypass EIS procedures. Those are there for a place. How will these people be vetted? How will we be assured there's no conflicts of interest? How will we be assured that there's no favoritism, cronyism, etc.? From what I understand, you can make decisions with as little as three people of the five people present. This is government-controlled capitalism, which eventually leads to fascism. I'm concerned when I hear crown or ceded lands, which are Kanakam-only lands, redefined to public lands, and finally just land. I think that's very dishonoring. I've heard before today the PLDC will be Oahu-centric, and I agree. Coming from Kauai, it's very hard. It cost me about $500 to get over here to the hotel room, the flight, to take time off from work. This is going to disadvantage the outer islands. I'm wondering, where is the oversight? You have appointees, and then you have division heads. Where is the oversight going to come from? This is such powerful sweeping changes. I, I just, I can't believe, that this is like a Saturday Night Live to have this in this tiny room of limited seating. Everyone in the state should be allowed to speak until time's up. I'm almost finished and it will be less than a minute. I'm wondering why the rush? I've been a talk show host for 15 years. I'm very fair. I bring Republicans, conservatives, liberals, Democrats, atheists, religious people. I get out of the way. I have not run across a single person in favor of this, not one. In Kauai, I was shocked at how few people know about this, but coming to Oahu, I spent a week here doing business for my work. I asked everyone I went in every hotel, shopping center, bank, mall, nobody even knows that their life is going to change. I think this issue is going to unite all the citizens of the state. I think it's going to leave a stain on the politicians and bureaucrats that support and fight for this. And finally, it reminds me of selling a kidney to pay for your hospital bill. It's absurd. Thank you. I think I'm going to move outside if somebody outside wants to come in and take my seat. And then uh, Martha Tongu. Jarvis and like Carlos the Troy, the previous speaker, I also flew over from Kauai at the encouragement of many friends and family there. Unfortunately, they couldn't uh, take the time or have the resources to come over here. We had a big meeting on Kauai, I think several uh, hundred people, a couple hundred at least, at uh, the elementary school. Mr. Harbuche, I think you remember that over there. Um, I'd like to just I was so moved by uh, Mahina Martin from Maui. Her testimony pretty much said everything that I would have liked to say. So if you wanted to include her, my name for the record on her testimony, I think it sums it up. But in addition to that, I just want to make sure that everybody listening knows that the County of Kauai, our County Council, unanimously voted to repeal uh, this, this act. I think they did so uh, from public pressure. and. Uh, I also, at our, at our uh, initial meeting, the one of the last speakers was uh, Gary Hoosier, and he's an appointee of the governor. Um, he stood up and spoke uh, with his displeasure of um, what uh, this act, what impact it would have on the citizens of Hawaii, and how he felt the EIS system uh, just wasn't even, if it was even been used, it has no teeth in it, it wouldn't protect the people from development. Um, I'd just like to say also that I have this really uneasy feeling that um, we have a system of laws, especially in Hawaii, that were put in place over a long period of years that were set up to protect our resources. And it, it seems like this act, um, it acts to circumvent all of those laws and expedite this development. And the real problem, I think, is that our government is broken. Our government has failed to take the taxes 
that we work hard to pay and use them in a way to maintain our resources. And I don't know where the money is going, but I, I don't know that this is going to fix it because if we sell our lands and offer them out, what's going to, what's going to happen when we have no land left to sell? We're going to be in the same spot. So something has to change that way. Um, and before I leave, I, I would like to compliment uh, Mr. Isla. I've been watching you. I can see that you're very engaged in the testimony, and I appreciate that. Um, all of the board members, but Mr. Isla especially, and I, I really do appreciate your your uh, attention. It's, it's, it looks very sincere, and I, I hope that this testimony is touching your heart and giving you some some thought. And that's it. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Nothing should be exempted from these protections. They were developed over time on a recognized path and state and attempting to prevent them in the future. <coughs> Exempting projects from these time-tested protections is foolish. Good planning is not a burden. It is a requirement. Good public engagement is not a burden, it's a requirement. The changes made to the rules as proposed do not address many of the public concerns that have been raised throughout this entire process, from the time the public became aware of the statutes now on the books to today. And many of us recall the PLDC, at the end discussion about the PLDC, that our public concerns would be addressed during the rulemaking process. And here we are in the rulemaking process, and that's not the case. I'd like to highlight testimony of other people who have mentioned that we actually don't need the PLDC to do any of the projects that have so far been proposed. Caring for our harbors, maintaining parking lots, cleaning toilets, those kinds of things don't require special exemptions. We can fulfill the obligations of government without doing unnecessary exemptions from laws meant to protect the public's best interest. And for these reasons, the outdoor circle and many people here urge you to not adopt these rules uh, and are actually going to advocate for the repeal of the PLC. Thank you. Lisa? And then uh, Frederick Berg? Hi, I'm Lisa Gandolati. I'm a senior at Milwaukee High School, and I'm here to object to the administrative rules and the access to the health. Living in Milwaukee, it's easy to understand the benefits and detriments of development being in the middle of it. As one of the first master plan communities in Hawaii, Milwaukee set the example for a somewhat more responsible mode of development. But the extent to which development has expanded is both unrealistic and unsustainable. This is the point that it is necessary to level off the development of our islands and shift to a mode of thinking where a solution can be made for the problems of existing development. Despite this dire and obvious need, we are doing precisely the opposite. This bill, as we know, gives the PLDT access to virtually any land it pleases. The possibility that this power will be used to expand agriculture, a more favorable option, is unlikely, and the implications of this bill are inescapable. <coughs> One consequence that hits close to home is the Coal Ridge Project. After decades of justified and logical resistance by the public, Coal Ridge, just one of countless anti-agricultural development plans, will be effortlessly approved through the passing of this bill. Coal Ridge 
will create an entire community of thousands of homes that Central Oahu would just not exist for. All surrounding areas, including Nolani, will be forced to endure the effects of this development. This is a story that people all around the island share, and we have come to together to save our future. If this bill is passed, it will result in a lifetime of recovery effort on the part of my generation. Although I would be completely willing to do this, I'd rather focus my efforts on a more positive rather than reactive movement. Save us from this terrible fate. Let us dedicate our lives to bettering our land instead of re restoring them from the results of this bill. Please vote to repeal Act 55. Thank you. Uh, and then Peter. <coughs> Thank you, board members, for the opportunity to uh, testify today. My name is Frederick Berg. I'm testifying on, on my own behalf. Um, I would like to say that I work for the Department of Hawaiian Homelands as well as private developers. So uh, I've sat on both sides of the fence. And uh, just the only thing I want to say is that we private, uh, public and private partnerships are very valuable to the state. It's worked for many, many years. And I would encourage all of us to get together to make sure that this can work um, positively for everybody involved. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Mr. Haraguchi uh, and members of the board. Uh, my name is Peter Lee. I'm with Hawaii Lessed. YLESA stands for the Hawaii Laborers Employers Cooperation and Education Trust. We are a labor management partnership between the Laborers Union of North America Local 368 and its 250 signatory contractors. Uh, we, rep we commend the LBC with clarifying the applicability of certain statutes that concerns all of us, particularly Chapter 343, the EIS law, Chapter 60, Historic Preservation, Chapter 92, Sunshine Law, uh, Chapter 104, Wage and Hour um, on Construction Projects, Chapter 171-64.7, Restriction of Sale of Seeded Land, and finally, Chapter 444, <coughs> 444 uh, Contractor Licensing Law. We support these proposed draft admin rules and PODC's effort to better utilize state resources create much needed income for the state and promote economic development. Mahalo for the opportunity to provide this one. Kyle Yamada and then Pauline McNeil. Pauline I'll take it. Oh, okay. Uh, good morning. I'm Kyle Yamada. I'm a senior at Nolani High School. Um, I'm supposed to be at school today, but I came down to offer my testimony. Uh, and on the administrative rules, I believe that it is um, in direct violation of the procedural due process. Um, what really scares me about the PLGC is the partnerships it aims to create. Um, if we look beyond the PLGC's exemption from the zoning and developing laws that the people and the government has to abide by when a public-private um, partnership is forged, what then happens? Even more ex exemption and the subsequent appropriation of the rights that the people of Hawaii were meant to enjoy would go to private corporations and their neighbors. This would then create direct <coughs> encroachment on the right to property and the rights to any mediation process. So every time I go up to the North Shore of Oahu, I'm in the car and I'm on Tam Highway, I look out the window yearning, yearning for a view of the ocean. Instead, I just look at houses, and every 200 meters or so, I finally catch that quick glimpse. And those few seconds of what should be joy, I'm just reminded of a steep miscalculation of an exter externality. The, the developers of these houses put off the connection with nature that we all want to see. And the houses say, um, they build destroy the ecosystems of the coastline. The PLGC supposedly had to comply with these 
environmental and federal regulations. Regardless, they hand over the Hawaiian land to non-local private corporations who are proven and perennial violators of these regulations. Um, this encroachment of private corporations on Hawaiian land and communities is an inherent flaw to which rewriting the laws wouldn't be a solution and the only thing that I can think of is the repeal of GWC. Thanks.
with this rich culture that can only be expressed and seen here. And this place is about, to me, this place is about family and connection. And one of the connections that PLDC I feel widely is the connection between the land and the people. I feel that the land is something that we share. It's actually public land because everybody is allowed access to it. And PLDC takes away our voice when it comes to public land. We don't know what you guys plan to do. We don't know what's going to go on. So we, we're not allowed to express our opinions and views on it. And I feel that that's not right because in a way, it's partly our land. It's our right to be able to say how we feel about it. Another thing about this Act 55 is that it, in a way, may alienate Hawaii because there is nowhere in the language of that that specifies what exactly can be done with this law. I know some people say it can be used for agriculture, but there's nowhere in the language that specifies that. And it scares me that this can be taken advantage of. Other things can be done with the land. And my generation and everyone after me is the, is, are the people that are going to have to deal with these consequences. We're going to have to live with the changes that are made to the public land. I'm gonna have to, we're going to have to live with the fact that we have lost our voice upon this, this act. We, we lose our voice and our say in government because we don't get to say what's happening to land that's taking away from us. It saddens me that this is actually up for debate, the fact that we're going to lose our voice because things can be made that we don't want happening. Things like our land getting taken away. And I have a little brother who loves going to the public parks and those beaches, and the chance that these places can be taken away from him, it scares me. <laughs> in the future, they're not even not know what it's like to go to these places.
However, there's been little changes in the rules that would ensure transparency, due diligence, and accountability in PLDC projects, community input on proposals that are carried out by the PLDC, and provide minimum standard of information that the public will have so they can meaningfully participate, um, mandate consultation with applicable state, county, and federal agencies, including OHA, um, as well as local civic clubs, Hawaiian Homestead Association, um, equal and transparent planning for all projects and culturally sensitive development projects. The aforementioned is um, a summary of our written comments, which I obviously won't read for you today. A little long, it'll take me longer than three minutes. <laughs> um, so we just wanted to, and I, I'm going to try to be as fast as possible, um, so I want to respect uh, everybody in the room who's come to testify. Um, as well as your time. So I wanted to re um, reiterate that the rules um, should reflect the POCC's Kuliana to Public Trust Asset, Native Hawaiian traditional and customary rights and the resources. Um, and a memo that was recently issued by the Legislative Reference Bureau confirms our concerns over POCC's exemptions and states that the projects are likely exempt from HRS 205, HRS 205A, as well as various county zoning. Failure to replace the planning tools embodied in the statute could result in decisions that, amongst other things, adversely impact Native Hawaiian traditional and customary practices, degrade natural and cultural resources, and adversely impact historically significant sites. I'm going to very briefly focus um, our testimony on suggestions to assist the PLDC in fulfilling its statutory obligations to develop an appropriate and culturally sensitive land development program and mandate that the PLDC consult with all appropriate county, state, and federal agencies. Um, unfortunately, there continues to be little in the rules that assure cultural sensitivity to the unique challenges that our beneficiaries face. Um, amongst other things, we believe and reiterate that the guidelines should, for PLDC projects should ensure that there's no interference with traditional and customary practices, that are the environmental resources and cultural resources are not impacted, and that ensures consultation. Um, while we believe that the PLDC's statutory responsibilities require that <coughs> the corporation um, incorporate cultural considerations throughout the entire planning process, the definition of culturally sensitive is only referred into the, in the administrative rules one time, um, and the remaining rules, uh, and that's in section 23, um, the remaining rules uh, fail to give cultural sensitivity its statutory authority and instead expressly allow projects that may not be culturally sensitive. If we look at section 22 of chapter 302, it describes an eligible project as one that helps preserve culture, agriculture, conservation, or preservation, which would allow projects to move forward that may not be culturally sensitive. And finally, um, OHA reiterates that the PLDC should mandate consultation with all applicable counties, uh, um, county, state, and federal agencies. This is particularly important because of the PLDC's exemptions. Um, the oversight agencies, really, um, for Chapter 205 and 205A, for example, so state and county agencies, they have objective oversight, specialized expertise and experience, and um, when they grant permission, either through a permit or a boundary amendment, for example, they do it on a case-by-case -case basis after making specific findings. Um, so while these agencies have this particular kuleana and expertise, um, you know, if the if the projects are exempt from those laws, the rules don't replace them with anything else, and we think that's concerning. So again, in conclusion, OHA urges the PLDC to adopt OHA's suggested amendments, or as always, we've been open to sitting down together and working on how the rules can ensure respect and protection for Native Hawaiian culture. Uh -huh. James and Nipsey. Chair Hamkuchi, Chair Nye. My name is James Napelli. I travel through today from Kilo. I'm representing myself. I'm a member of the Kenoi Nagu Industrial Area Association as well. I'm in the discussions with the other lessees in the Hilo industrial area. And uh, I'm here to support the adoption of the rules. It seems there will be a, a vigorous and extensive debate with, uh, regarding PLDC. 
and the lessons in Hilo consider the PLDC to be a evolution of Hawaii's uh, significant and extensive land use laws going back to the 60s and the land use commission uh, with a state that has 40% uh, ownership of all the lands, there's always going to be concerns with how the lands are, are used. In our instance, we're talking about highly developed industrial properties and resort properties in Hilo. Anybody who has visited Hilo knows that the uh, current industrial plant is dilapidated and it has to do with the nature of leasehold and the inability of the lessees to uh, improve what amounts to wasting assets. Uh, to the PLDC's and our board's awareness, this map here was developed in conjunction with the county of Hawaii and the orange and brown colors reflect state ownership of industrial properties in Hilo. About 91% of all industrial lands in Hilo are owned by the state of Hawaii. So it's a significant help, and the Banyan Drive is 100%, which is our resort area. So it's very important that the state have some um, flexibility in how to approach the, uh, the, the utility of these leases. This is the muscle and the bone of Hilo's small business. If we are going to have an attractive face, which is tourism and Banyan Drive, Hilo needs help. We're a sick entity right now, and our economy is suffering due to the failure of our industrial base and our resort areas. The state DLNR has a list of income producing properties. 87% of them are in Hilo. There are over 918 parcels of land between the Hilo Wharf and Panaeva, where the agricultural lands begin. This is a very difficult group of parcels to manage. DLNR uh, has many responsibilities, and land redevelopment and land planning is a very significant specialty that is very difficult to assume. And this is the first time it has to be done. Most of these leases began after the 1960 tsunami. We're reaching the end of the statutory period for these leases. So it's very important that the government be aware of how this uh, land tenure system is affecting Hilo. In the preamble to SB 1555, which was became the PLDC, the focus was also on the optimization of state lands. So regardless of what occurs with the discussions regarding uh, the PLDC as it was formed, I'd like to recommend that the board and all the legislatures that uh, attend to this issue consider the Public Land Redevelopment Corporation as the primary focus in the beginning of this process. Let's make use of our underutilized wasting assets, such as the Hilo Industrial Area and Banyan Drive. It's very important that we become more efficient in our use of already developed urban properties. Thank you very much. must be strictly scrutinized. 
environmental and public reviews possibly should not be compromised here. But I also feel that in troubled economic times, we must find creative ways of meeting important state goals. Sometimes the worst of times can bring out the best new solutions to tackle problems. And I think that through the PLDC, we can do some of those things. The public, the Public Lands Development Corporation can enter into public and private partnerships, not only to expedite projects, but also in light of the state's economic, um, current economic situation, to cost share. There have been several examples of such <coughs> partnerships, and some of the previous speakers have addressed those, many with very good results, such as the fast-tracking of building new schools on the west side of this island. Perhaps there are other, even more creative opportunities that should be explored. One problem um, that continues to plague this state is the entry and the establishment of invasive species. For years, there has been talk of the establishment of centralized inspection facilities at all the ports of entry to stem the tide of invasive species entering Hawaii and disrupting our fragile ecosystems and in return, our agricultural industry. For well over a decade, little has been done to move this agenda forward, in large part um, due to the economic downturn and lack of adequate funds. It is difficult to be able to conduct inspections properly without the proper tools or the facilities or the facility, facilities to do so. And we're going to continue to lose ground on this invasive species issue unless there is something done much more creatively. I believe that a public public partnership could help alleviate waiting another decade or so for something to be done. The PLDC could explore proactive options and expedite the process of bringing part partnering entities together for the good of the state. I firmly believe that the PLDC should be allowed to establish their rules, which will help to better define and set the parameters for its activities to allow important programs such as these to move forward. Thank you for the opportunity. Senator. Chair of the Department of Land and Natural Resources. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I've submitted some written testimony, but I guess I just want to touch on some points. A lot of people today testify in front of you about positive things that can be done. Uh, Jim McCulley was talking about the redevelopment of the Hilo industrial area and the Banyan Drive rural areas. We do not need an exemption from existing state land use laws or county zoning laws to redevelop those areas. They are already zoned and classified for urban and resort use. Dino Gimodo was talking about agricultural accessory facilities, uh, value-added processing for agricultural operations. You do not need an exemption from county zoning or state land use laws to build those facilities on agricultural lands. They are off. Sheldon Lane was talking about the need to repair existing infrastructure, our roads, our bridges. We do not need an exemption from state land use laws or county zoning to repair those facilities. Nor do you need an exemption to enter into public-private partnerships for development. This board heard testimony from across the entire state, and one of the premier complaints that you were asked to address in your administrative rules was the fact that the Public Land Development Corporation is exempt from state and local land use laws and zoning. And that's the biggest fear that people have. If all you want to do is do the positive redevelopment that people have talked about today, or that is being pictured up there on the screen, all of that is allowed under the existing zoning, and you can follow those rules. And you had the opportunity to adopt rules that said that you would abide by these key land use and zoning laws. And you did not do so. In fact, the amendments that you made actually made it worse. 
-hmm. Because under your original draft rules, section 13302-25, your original draft rules actually require <coughs> all PLDC projects to follow existing laws, charter provisions, and rules and be as consistent with the county community or development plans for the area as, as is practical. So your original draft rules did commit to following some of the local zoning laws and charter provisions relating to the county community and development plans. But in the amendments that are before you today, you took that language out. You struck the requirement to follow existing laws, charter provisions, and rules. So you eliminated even a, a shadow of a commitment to follow some type of zoning. Another complaint that was heard by you as you went around stating your administrative rules is the fact that there is no meaningful opportunity for public input when the PLDC engages in significant decision making about development. And I find it disappointing that even though you were fully aware about this complaint, that you chose to hold a single hearing today in Honolulu in the middle of the day before making a recommendation back to the board on the adoption of these rules. I think the board had the option to resolve a lot of the community concerns and it did not address that in your rule amendments. And the board has demonstrated today in this hearing that it's more interested in expediency than in providing Hawaii residents with an opportunity for meaningful public input. And according to my interpretation of your actions today, this board has confirmed the need for the legislature to take up Act 55 again and either repeal it or significantly amend it because we cannot rely on the board or the staff to adopt um, good governance practices. this economic times that we have today. 
And so GC remains in full support of the PLDC and further working with it, whether the legislature um, looks at it again. But we're positive and we want to remain positive and encourage the public to stay informed. Don't be misled by all the negative comments and everything that people are trying to downplay this organization as being. And with that, I thank you for the opportunity. And then Pico. Good morning, Executive Director, members of the Commission. Um, I'd also like to thank the members of the public who came today. Obviously, uh, the um, engineering work is not easy, so thank you uh, for the opportunity to uh, engage in this engineering process with everybody who's here. Um, when Act 55 was passed, concerns were raised thereafter. There were promises made by a number of key legislators in support of the bill who said, don't worry, the concerns about uh, environmental protection, cultural resources, and public process will be taken care of through the administrative rules. Uh, so that's why we participated through the administrative rule process with a fairly high level of engagement. We submitted comments uh, to Mr. Haraguchi uh, during the first draft. Uh, we submitted comments to you when it actually went out for circulation. Uh, we have taken the time to talk to the individual commissioners and suggest rules. And it's been frustrating in that, A, there hasn't been a lot of back and forth on that, and B, most of those proposals, which are relatively modest, um, they're taken from other laws that are designed to ensure that environmental resources are protected. It doesn't say you can't do projects, it simply says projects are going to have significant adverse impacts. Uh, will not be allowed to go forward unless you mitigate it. And those revisions haven't been included. If anything, the rules are going in the opposite direction. And it's obvious they're being written by somebody who wants to protect the Public Land uh, Commission's discretion to build approved projects. So if you want to approve a project that destroys 1,000 acres of Okia Forest, you can. If you want to do a project that destroys a beach, you can. Build a hotel in areas that most people would say are pristine, shouldn't be, you can. And you're not trying to take those projects off the table, or at least say that we're going to try to mitigate those projects. So, you know, through this process, you know, over four attempts to offer suggestions, revisions, that haven't taken up. Um, you know, unfortunately, this body itself is creating the fuel um, by which the public is saying that we should uh, repeal this law. It's creating the fuel by which people have an opportunity to criticize this process, because really, administrative rules were supposed to be the area by which you're able to say, hey, certain environmental and certain cultural protections are being built in. And unfortunately, this draft does not do that. Um, there is very powerful concern by the public. Um, it's very real. Um, and we have a lot of examples of bad government projects that have happened in the past. Um, and so, you know, when you say we're giving an agency that's exempt from laws that were created for, uh, after decades of experience, I mean, there's a reasonable basis for this concern. So, you know, looking forward, you know, looking at you know, public access, making sure that public parks are available to certain community areas, so kids growing up have parks, uh, making sure that beaches are protected, so much like the UP project in Maui doesn't occur, where we actually lose a beach forever and ever. Um, you know, things like making sure that you guys have minimum standards for uh, building codes, uh, making sure that the projects move forward aren't slum projects, uh, and, and staying that in the rules. Long-term planning, you know, making sure that we're really trying to do that, and simply saying that we will let the community participate in the infrastructure conversations really isn't that long-term planning. Uh, and I guess I'd also like to point out that the strategic plan, which I think was a good step or a good effort to try to say, hey, you know, we're going to try to recognize certain things, is not binding. It's not, you know, it's not an obligation on you, and it's not an obligation on future um, public land development corporation commissioners. So you're making a promise to the public, saying, hey, don't worry, we're not going to do this on important ag land, but there's really no <coughs> binding there. So in some ways, I'd say it's almost an abuse of the public's trust. Now, I don't say that individually of any of you. I say that as the broad statement. If you're going to go out in public and say we're not going to do that, then please make it in the rules. Please make sure that there is some commitment to that, that, that statement. Finally, again, I have to say these images are almost sort of insulting um, that are going up on here. You know, I'm involved in some of the DMR projects to do public private. We do those already. And you know, some of them are great, some of them are hard. A lot of times I think it really has to do with the resources 
in the lockout. That's why I think the Sierra Club's been a strong supporter of trying to find alternative funding mechanisms for DLNR, making sure you have the resources to actually do these things adequately. So, you know, to tell the public that we need it to protect Iliaki or to look more like a national park, I think it is really, uh, it's not being candid, it's not being fair. And if that's really what we intended, I suggest revise the rules to say please do such projects that we're going to take off those destruction of pristine forests. We're going to take protection of beaches seriously, the Coastal Zone Management Act, et cetera, um, and, and we commit to that. And that's the way you build trust, that's the way you build um, public support for these such projects. Thank you for the opportunity to have the time. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kika Bukowski. I represent the Hawaii Building and Construction Trades Council. I'm here uh, representing the uh, organized uh, organized labor in the construction industry. And I, I did submit written testimony. I'd like to stand on a written testimony and just offer a few brief comments, if I may. Um, you know, first of all, I just want to state that we, we, we respect and uh, and. Uh, really are listening hard to some of the, the comments made by those who oppose uh, the PLDC primarily, you know, while recognizing this isn't the time and place to oppose the PLDC. This body did not create the PLDC, it was created in the legislature. So there's a time and place for everything. We're here to try to uh, move forward and, and try to uh, work within the rules and, and make it the best that we can moving forward. And, and we're very encouraged by what we've seen so far in our interaction with the PLDC. We've had concerns uh, with the rules as they first came out in the first drafts. Uh, as, an, as an industry, as a coalition of, of organized labor in construction, it, it brings concern when we hear about uh, circumventing building standards and, and building and, and zoning and whatnot. That hits to the core of our industry. So uh, if anybody, and, and with, with all due respect to the, to the Hawaiian culture and, and Hawaiian uh, concerns, the construction industry has a, has a stake in this game as well uh, from an industry standpoint. So we take it very seriously. Uh, we have been very encouraged with, with the response and interaction we've had with PLDC in incorporating some of the amendments that we've proposed uh, that addresses our concerns and we continue to follow. The only thing I can, I can suggest to those who haven't seemed to find the same kind of uh, satisfaction is to stay engaged in the process. This is the process. Stay engaged, stay informed. Um, you know, some of the comments that were made that I, I'd like to just kind of point on is that yes, as it was stated, maybe some of these projects that we're looking at doesn't require some of these special exemptions. But what it does require that we lack is funding. And that's what the PLDC is, is uh, partially intended to provide, that, that uh, mechanism to provide creative financing through private-public partnerships. So we look at that as a positive. Um, and again, we just, you know, we just ask that, that those who are not quite pleased with what they've seen so far, please stay engaged and uh, appreciate this opportunity to testify in support. Thank you. Objection to the public land administrative rules 301, 302, and I'm not sure what happened to 303, but uh, that itself is a problem as well. <coughs> the bottom line is you know and we know that you could plow through this whole process, that you could just sit stoically and just go through the process and check out the process and in the very end, you can get what you want because you are the big government. There's no doubt about that. None of us have any doubts about that. But the bottom line is, is this how we want our government to be run? 
is this how we're going to protect the future of Hawaii? Let me just um, point out a few, um, few points here. We continue to be very alarmed that the PLDC sport insists on plowing this highly controversial uh, plan on despite fierce <coughs> public opposition. You will remember that there were unprecedented opposition throughout the whole island of, of against PRBC. And yet, at the end of that controversial tour circuit that you had throughout the island, only 10% of the sweat and tears and energy that people put into it will really recognize. The rest, which we referred to as a lot of cultural concerns there were all not included. And actually, and also again, I just want to quickly point that we again object to the PLC members' ties to big government and uh, big business. This does not vote well for the public. As well, again, there is no Hawaiian or environmentalist or John Q. public appointed to this very, very elite board. And may I also add that it is very curious that out of our island of a million people, that Mr. Robert Bobby Bunda has to be in the Hawaii Authority of Rapid Transportation, the real heart as well as this PLDC. It does not bode well for the public when one person can be afforded on two most powerful boards on this island. And again, we're very alarmed at the lack of information given to the public concerning the big picture, interrelated goals of PLDC and the Honolulu Rail Transit Oriented Development. <coughs> Tomorrow there will be a meeting and all these all this, um, groups here really have very, very dangerous capabilities to <coughs> condemn and to seize, power, seize private property lands to eminent domain and this is something that the public has not been able to connect the dots together. But I would encourage the public to look at the top documents. And in it, in the July minutes of this year, you will see the interaction of PLDC and TOP, as well as other big developments. In fact, tomorrow there's going to, there's going to be a meeting where HART is going to uh, discuss whether they would want to create a council of developers. And again, you are playing semantic rules. This is so much. Uh, this is so much a exercise of semantic gamesmanship. A developer is no longer a developer in the rules. A developer is now called a project planner. And again, we submit to you that creating a FISM such as PLDC is not an answer to good governance. We do not, <coughs> we do not need another layer of bureaucracy, especially one that would be above the law and controlled by a few appointed elite cronies of big government and big business. The way to lean and efficient government is to discipline its spending and tighten its management and priorities, whether in lean times or in good times, big government has got to rein in its spending or there will never be enough money for the government to spend. Again, in the public interest, we submit that the Department of Land and Natural Resources must must remain the entity to manage the public's assets and resources. Instead of siphoning funds and resources from DNR, the governor should seek ways to support and strengthen DLNR <coughs> in this kuleana to protect, conserve, and manage Hawaii's precious and finite resources. PLC, PLDC and TOT, for that matter, is not about making Hawaii's lands better for people, 
invoking motherhood and echo pilers of improving public schools and parks and harbors and workforce housing and so forth does not work with us anymore. We are no longer gullible. And we are Hawaii. We're not Russia. We're not China. And the governor had asked us to paddle our island canoe. But to us, we are expected to paddle in the island canoe. But PLDC wants to be the luxury cruise liner with reserva reservations to only a few elite groups. PLDC is detrimental to Hawaii's finite and precious resources. We cannot allow short-term desires for perceived, and I say perceived, profits to squash the birthright of Hawaii's future generations. The irreparable damage cannot be corrected. Please do not plow on. PLDC must be abolished through appeal of Act 55. Thank you. My name is Ben Sadowski and I'm with you guys here at Local Pod. After the last round of public hearings on the PLDC, the organization was supposed to refine its administrative rules based on public comments. It is now clear that the voices of Hawaii citizens have not been heard, and that the PLDC has no intention of listening to us. That's why we're advocating for the appeal of the law. And maybe that's why this hearing is at 10.30 in the morning, in the middle of the week. Previously, Local 5 testified regarding the need for labor peace provisions, which would protect the state's investment in lodging-related projects. But this is not found its way into the rules. Nor is the PLDC agreed to put restrictions in its own rules against developing agricultural land, despite what the strategic plan states. More than that, there are too many significant loopholes throughout these administrative rules, which could diminish still further the public's already reduced and often ignored input into the future of our state. For instance, in the revised rules, projects no longer have to generate revenue as long as they're self-sustaining. The original, albeit flawed, stated purpose of this bill was for the PLDC to be a way for the state to generate revenue. Under the revised regulation, it can develop our public land without even doing that. This violates the statute and therefore, the proposed regulation will be invalid if adopted. Two of the early steps of the revised development process uh, are the project application and an initial project proposal. Both of these could be written by the PLDC which will then decide whether to approve the project. It seems unlikely that the PLDC would reject its own project, even if the public is against it. Uh, the PLDC's recent actions have proven that. In fact, the PLDC administrator can decide to waive the initial proposal entirely, which is very problematic. It's possible that the title agency, the owner of whatever land the PLDC wants to develop, could listen to the public and refuse to transfer the land, unless the PLDC buys the land itself, which it will very soon have a budget to do. And then there will be no title agency, and thus no public input there. We've been told that the county can impose conditions on the projects, but by these rules, those can only be related to infrastructure. And their ability to do that comes after the initial project proposal, assuming that the administrator requires one, which he or she may not. It's unclear when or even how the county or anyone else could meaningfully weigh in if this is waived. And then there's the final project proposal. The administrator can waive all sorts of conditions there too, including the final EIS, the status of compliance with HRS 6E, and the development schedule, uh, among other things. I could go on, but I'll leave you with one final point. In the initial draft of the rules, PLDC was required to make optimal use of public land for the economic, environmental, or social benefit of the people of Hawaii. Now, all a project has to do is help a department or agency achieve its goals, which are undefined. In summary, these rules show exactly why the PLDC is bad for Hawaii and why it should be repealed. Short of that, we would need to significantly amend the law before the public can truly be assured that our voices will be heard in any discussion about the future of our state. You know, I pointed out here just a few of the aspects of the revised rules, which are very troubling. 
uh, and these come even after all of the public comment on the initial proposed rules. Uh, but ultimately, we feel like you know this, this continues to be too problematic and that it should be repealed. But thank you very much. Mr. Hooser and then uh, Laulani Teal. Oh, Laulani. Sorry, can't read. Laulani. Laulani. Good afternoon, Mr. Director and members. My name is Gary Hooser. I'm the uh, Director for the Office of Environmental Quality Control, presently on leave and have been in that position for almost two years dealing with Chapter 343 Environmental Impact Statement uh, laws. I'm also a uh, council member elect from the County of Kauai and former state senator representing Kauai and Eaton House for eight years. Uh, I'm speaking today as an individual on my own behalf, not on behalf of the council or, or the Office of Environmental Quality or anyone else. Um, my, my first question, my first concern has to do with the hearings. Uh, as a neighbor islander, like, like many people here, uh, I had to spend you know, $250 to come here and get, get my three minutes. And uh, I'm very disturbed uh, about that and wanted to know why the uh, PLDC has chosen not to have hearings on the neighbor islands. Is, is it a budget issue? Is it a, is it a policy issue? Do you, do you believe that enough input here, you don't need the neighbor islands? I mean, that's a third of the state's population has been basically left out of the process. Do you have a response? You can submit your questions and I'll respond to you after. Okay. okay. I would like very much to know, uh, know that. It's my understanding that over 80%, possibly as much as 90% of the land potentially impacted by the PLDC is located on the neighbor islands. Uh, a previous young woman spoke very eloquently about losing a voice, not having a voice in this process. And I would say today is proof that a good third of the state has no voice today. Uh, in fact, the very creation of the PLDC through Senate Bill 155, five, there was no opportunity whatsoever for the public to testify on the substance of the bill that created the PLDC. The public has had no voice, and it's no wonder that people are angry, that people want to talk on, on the substance of the issue. The creation, the, the PLDC allows projects to bypass general plans. Again, communities like Kauai, those general plans are updated every 10 years. There's numerous community meetings where people have a voice, and they come out and they express their voice of where they want planning, where they want development, where they don't want development. And the PLDC allows all of that, all those voices to be ignored. Um, I support a full repeal of the PLDC in Act 55, but I do have some suggestions for the rules as well. The, you know, the PLDC takes away county home rule. Mm -hmm. The PLDC grants extraordinary powers to its development partners. It exempts projects from county plans, county zoning, and county land use laws. It gives all this power and control to three appointees, three of five appointees, appointees by the governor, at will appointees. And so like one question I have is when the three governor's appointees who are there as a result of the election of the governor are gone with the election of a new governor, what is their plans and the rules or otherwise for a transition when you have three people immediately leave the positions of a five-member board. Secondly, I, I see no provisions for mitigation to environmental impacts in the rules. A lot of talk is about, well, 343 still applies, 343 still applies. Three, 343, chapter 343 is simply a disclosure document. Chapter 343 discloses environmental impacts, but there's no requirement, uh, from what I can tell, under these rules and under the law, that there any mitigation whatsoever is required on these development projects. Those mitigation requirements should be at the minimum included in the rules. Also, there's a lot of talk about coordinating and consulting with the counties on PLDC projects. I see nothing in the rules that 
that specifies whether that consultation coordination is with the mayor, with the council, of which I will be sitting, with the planning commission, or with agencies within the county. During the normal process, the council often has a say over land use issues. Certainly the planning commission has a say, and the mayor and the agencies obviously have a say. But it's, it does, it's not clear, it just says coordinate and consult. You know, there's many, many items uh, that, I, that I'm very, very troubled uh, by the creation of this. Again, during the legislative process, there was no opportunity, and the public record is really clear, there's no opportunity for the public to testify on the substance of the creation of PLDC. And I'm concerned that the hearings are not being held on the Island. I'm concerned and share my dissatisfaction with the messages being projected on the board. The fact that this meeting is held in a room that is, is far too limiting at a time when there's a lot of people outside there. Um, for these reasons and many other, again, I encourage you to look strongly at the rules and make it clear that I support a full repeal. Thank you very much.
the PLDC board actually showed up what they want to say, even where we spoken, our voices had not been heard. <coughs> I would expect anything different in the future, especially if they're both going to force them to hear our voices. I say, this way, that's why we <coughs> The right of Hawaii's working people to reveal the PLDC. Good afternoon, I'm Michelle Madsen, I'm the President of the Oahu Island Parks Conservancy, as well as a member of the um, Governor of the Advisory uh, Committee and the Governor of our Advisory Council. I'm here today um, because I want you to know I'm going to strongly and actively support the repeal of the PLDC. These proceedings have been an insult to the public. And I know that you are not directly responsible to it for this type of conflict. But I have things to say about the rules and the statute, which I would like to put on record today. Because two of you here, I have worked with, I respect, and I know you will understand how everyone has felt and will continue to feel. The PLDC's governing statutes provide that any state or city agency may transfer development rights for lands under their jurisdiction to the PLDC if the PLDC board, a majority of three individuals, finds that such public lands are suitable for its development purposes. The PLD statute carries the force of law. However, this statute, which supersedes any rules, can be loosely interpreted and broadly states that PLDC projects shall be exempt from all statutes, ordinances, charter provisions, and rules of any government agency relating to special improvements, district assessments, requ requirements, land use, zoning, and construction standards. These are open-ended exemptions. Chapter 343 and 205A are environmental impact disclosure and shoreline protection statutes. Statutes from which the PLDC is exempt in its own government statutes. And Honolulu established zoning regulations um, are governed by the city land use ordinance. PLDC is exempt from ordinance. The PLDC rules have no substantive criteria to protect natural and cultural resources. PLDC proposed projects cannot cause harm to natural resources. The LNR mission is to protect and manage state public lands and natural resources in the public interest. If DLNR lands are transferred to the PLDC for development purposes, these lands will be lost from the stewardship the DLNR is mandated to provide. So in reality, the PLDC will be paying DLNR for giving up public land for PLDC development unrelated to DLNR's mission. Further, once transferred to PLDC control by any agency agreement or conveyance, these public lands will no longer be defined and protected as public lands according to Act 282 of this year. How will public lands be protected if they are no longer public lands under Act 282? Instead, under the fatally flawed PLDC statute, our public lands will be slated for exploitation by the PLDC quote from the statute for local, national, and international markets. The PLDC is enabled to authorize unfettered development, conservation lands, agricultural lands, school campuses, open public shorelines, public lands with documented significant Makamakai view claims, such as Makamakai. The Coastal Zone Management Act protects our project coastlines. The public is exempt from the legal directors of the CZM program, which is intended to protect Hawaii's valuable coastal system, ecosystems, <coughs> beaches, marine resources, and public beach access, and to ensure a balance between development, public use, and preservation for future generations. In addition, the PLDC is exempt from shoreline setbacks, including the prohibition of structures in the shoreline area. This is contrary to growing efforts to remove new construction away from the shoreline in anticipation of documented sea level rise. 
because of the PLDC's governing statute and uh, that the fact that it's fatally flawed, important agricultural lands necessary for farming and sustainable food production <coughs> purposes can be freely developed. A token strategic plan developed by the governor and Senator Dela Cruz purports that the PLDC won't develop important agricultural lands. But this strategic plan does not carry the weight of law. It is simply a proposed placebo supplement to rules written and rewritten to sugarcoat the PLDC's fatally flawed governing statute. The PLDC is clearly exempt from permitting and zoning processes that normally enforce legal safeguards. And the proposed PLDC rules continue to not clarify how significant laws will be followed in view of PLDC project exemption. Act 282 of this year lifts limitations on zoning use, height, density, and intensity of PLDC development. How will significant standing, standing land use laws be monitored and enforced given the PLDC exemptions to permitting and zoning processes? Where is specific criteria for project approval? How and when will the public be notified regarding specific exemptions that apply to each project. The flawed PLDC statute enables the Hawaii Community Development Authority to assist the PLDC in identifying public lands for IT development, determining the highest and best revenue generation from public lands identified, entering into public-private agreements with developers to develop the public lands identified, and to lead the development, financing, improvement, or enhancement of the selected development. This is in the governing statute. I will be concluding shortly. Why are developers of prior projects who have violated environmental laws or have broken compliance commitments allowed the special exemptions and privileges offered by the PLDC? Why should developers be allowed to negotiate deals in secret without competitive bidding? Why is it that one-third of the PLDC's proposed rules are not being brought up at this hearing? Section 303, Facility Infrastructure Development and Property Assessment Financing Accessory to PLDC Public Land Development Projects. These proposed rules establish a procedure for the PLDC to undertake and finance public works projects, including highway storm, storm drainage systems, utility corridors, water systems, sewer systems, and other public facilities to support PLDC land development projects by taking any land needed for these facilities and assessing area property owners for the cost. In conclusion, the PLDC must have an open and transparent process for accountability and to prevent abuse. PLDC's governing statute is fatally flawed because there is no definition or standard of appropriate or culturally sensitive. And the rules have no enforceable protections for Native Hawaiian traditions and customary rights. So how can the PLDC proceed to comply with the statutory purpose of administering an appropriate and culturally sensitive public land development corporate, uh, program? There must be meaningful community input on each island where a PLDC project is proposed to take public land. Yet prior to approval of the community-based master plan for Kakakumakai, the HCDA executive director, who will be advising the PLDC, stated that the community-based master plan was merely a flexible conceptual framework subject to foreclosure. And that is a quote. Thank you. Thank you. This was followed within a few months by certain legislators and developers working together to remove ACDA's statutory requirement to collaborate and consult with the community, clearly a forerunner to the intent to dilute the public process replicated in exemption bills introduced this last session to benefit the PLDC. My final sentence. Given the continuing wide gap in the PLDC's proposed administrative rules and the fatal flaws within the PLDC's governing statute, 
subject to myriad interpretation now and in the future by unknown persons. There continues to be no question that the sugar-coated rules remain deficient and defective and that the PLDC statute must be repealed and the PLDC abolished in the public interest. Thank you. And then Mr. Wheelock. My name is Juanita Mahiana Ella Brown Kawamoto, and I am here as a Native Hawaiian citizen advocate that supports the repeal of the PLDC. How many times in Hawaii's history do we have to continue to allow bad legislation that disavows and omits the participation and inclusion of the people of Hawaii? The legislature, the current executive administration, and the private business sectors that lurk in the background while this horrible second coming of the short-sighted, ill-advised, disastrous redo of a 2011 Mahele commences to take advantage of an economically diseased state of affairs that expects to solve our financial woes by short-sighted rules, policies, practices, and procedures. The PLDC will commit our last remaining precious resources to joint ventures with qualified persons for the development and financing of future projects in unsuspecting communities without the required input of the people because we are trusting a single individual to appoint members of a board that has minimum to no obligation to have to include the people in the decisions for the development of our public assets. The creation of this bad legislation and its evil twin, the Hawaii Department of Agriculture's Agricultural Development Corporation, will throw our public trust in government into an abyss we will not be able to survive. No manner of amendments to the, uh, this unjust and illegally devised form of bad legislation will redeem the PLDC or the roles played by deceitful legislators with self-motivated agendas. Please follow the right direction of the good leadership that is currently introducing bills to repeal the PLDC. Hawaii cannot afford the devastating effects from this kind of bad legislation with a corporate institution that can disregard he Hawaii ao. We are capable of so much better when we are inclusive of our community and hui kulana kaupale. Mahalo for your attention to you. And then Stuart Coleman. speak. I know democracy can be a little messy sometimes when you know, sometimes our democracy has gotten so bureaucratic and so big it's almost like uh, just a, a branding label that we have a democracy. But, uh, you know, maybe it's just a democracy between a Coke and a Pepsi and uh, a 20-story building or a 40-story building and there's really not much input but we still have to open the doors and let the public in. And my hope is that the people that crafted this legislation, from the governor on down, uh, and those legislators and congressmen, that they would at least take the time to listen to the transcript or watch the video of these people testifying. Because this is the backbone of democracy, of hearing the people. And I would just say, uh, we had a person testifying here about the benefits of fast tracking going beyond the rules and regulations that have all been put in place by people and organizations and governments. Well, we can see what happened with fast food. I've been in Hawaii almost 40 years, and I'm shocked how many fast food places there are. Fast food is so destructive to your health, diabetes, obesity, etc., that there's a whole movement now called the slow food movement. Eat real food. 
cook it yourself. If you want french fries, make it yourself. So I think fast tracking is very dangerous. This is, there's a whole book written on government's fast tracking thing called the Shock Doctor. I advise anyone with any interest to read it by Naomi Klein. It's all about, in a crisis, uh, certain greedy elements, corporate elements are lurking in the scene and they try to go in and try to change the rules and regulations that will benefit them. So many times, it's, you saw this happen after 9-11. We got this uh, potentially democracy killing Patriot Act. We got two huge resource wars that were uh, told we needed to have that really benefited transnational corporations. We got a bailout, one of the largest bailouts and giveaways of wealth in the history of the world where the average citizen's money got kicked up to big time corporate and uh, Wall Street gamblers who stayed a little too long at the, real, uh, the roulette table lost their pants and came begging to us to bail them out. And so this is what we were seeing all over the world. All over the world, the corporations, the big money interests are drooling over the commons, the common wealth that the people have, the schools, the land, uh, the prisons, you start corporatizing schools and lands and prisons and all this stuff, and it'll be the Walmartization. There'll be a few people, a few shareholders making all, all the money. Look at the, the corporate list of the most wealthy people. Five of them are the Walmart heirs. But do people at Walmart make any money? No, they have to go on food stamps. So this is the nature of what our problem is. And if you allow corporate interest to come in to try to make money on the, on the commons, it's, it's just a catastrophe. We can go slow. We don't, we don't need to be in a hurry. But the faster we go, the more we're going to destroy this planet. It's just very, very obvious now. That atmosphere is only... You can drive up the Mauna Kea in uh, about half an hour, and you can't breathe up there. That's how little our Earth is. There's a little envelope. If I go to India, uh, for a month every year and, and other places around there and it's they've got development they've got development you can't believe but you can't breathe the air you get sick within a couple of days there I get out of there right away but just spending one night in Delhi I get a head cold um, people have asthma there people are going to die we don't need to exhaust this planet any faster we all have a job to do we want to create jobs it's the same job that every citizen has ever had on the face of the earth, and that's to provide for his family, to keep the environment clean and safe for his predecessors, because we live in a circular world. We don't live in a world with endless expansion, unless we can create a rocket ship and go to another planet and screw that up. Thank you very much. Stuart Coleman, and then Anthony. <coughs> Good afternoon. My name is Stuart Coleman, and I'm the flight coordinator at the Surfrider Foundation. And uh, I appreciate you hearing our testimony. We've uh, heard uh, a lot of people, and this is one of probably the most controversial issues I've seen uh, in a long time. I think an uh, uh, overwhelming amount of testimony is, is against it. But I'd like to say, you know, I don't think people are necessarily against your aims. Um, the idea of some public private financing because the agencies are underfunded. This is happening across the country. Um, as the previous gentleman said, uh, the counties and, and government agencies are underfunded and there are projects that could be done. Uh, I don't think this is the way to do it because the analogy I use is when you're looking to um, our infrastructure across the country is decaying, right? Um, we have bridges that need to be rebuilt and repaired. Um, but instead of working on the existing laws, because anybody who's gone through a permitting process knows there's a lot of room for improvement, and they need to be, you know, uh, improved so you know, these things can be expedited. Everyone gets that. Government bureaucracy can be a problem. But instead of improving that, you're doing an end around. And it's a shortcut. 
And the shortcuts you often end up taking the longest amount of time and causing the most amount of problems. Um, and so if you look at, you know, when you know the previous governor tried to go and move the super ferry through, you know, and tried to shortcut a lot of the environmental uh, precautions there, that created a nightmare for businesses and government and the people alike. Um, and I think that's what we're, we're, we're creating here um, by, you know, trying to um, bypass a lot of these, you know, for the building codes, for the environmental, and for the cultural. Now, I know for you all and for people above who are pushing this, it seems like, no, we're going to have all those things. There's still plenty in place. But if you look at some of, there are already places that are targeted, and we've heard of places, you know, like the natatorium, um, it seems like a great thing. That's been decaying by the shoreline. Of course we want to come in there and do something, but it's not that easy. Um, I've been studying the natatorium issue, you know, for more than 10 years, and it's very complex uh, because, you know, this is a park. It was created as a memorial park. You can't, you know, even though it seems promising to, to you know, rebuild the stadium and do something by the sea, um, when you're talking, you know, commissions study this for, a, you know, over a year, and they found that the best way to do it was to build a beach, to return it to the people. Well, any public, any group, private group that comes in there, any company, that's not the thing they want. They want to privatize it. They want to, you know, create a show, um, like a hula show or something, that can actually make money. And it seems good on the surface, but it's not. This is the last local beach. And so you have these places all across the state that are being cherry-picked and saying, look, we could do great things with this. But these steps are in place for a reason. They're public input. And I think even rushing this book, this bill through the legislature, having been there, you know, the testimony was overwhelming against it. And yet, the powers that be, the people who know, were like, no, this is good, we're moving it through. Um, and that just right there kind of betrayed the public you know, trust. Because it was like the overwhelming, as you can hear, see here, testimony was against it. So I would just caution that, you know, in trying to expedite the process, you might be creating a nightmare for you all, for, you know, other government agencies, for the people, and the companies that are going to be involved. So I would ask you to, you know, kind of uh, reconsider a lot of these rules. You know, the, the public, public financing, I think, you know, people could get behind some of the aspects, but expediting all the environmental building codes and those reviews and, and regulations, I think, would not be a good idea. Thank you. And then, uh, Michael. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Director Haraguchi, members of the board, for this opportunity to testify. Um, I'm chair of the Oahu Group of the Sierra Club, but I'm testifying in my individual uh, capacity. Um, and in some ways, I feel a need to apologize. Uh, because I'm a Malahini, I've only been living in Hawaii for seven years. Um, and I know the great work that has been done by people at BLMR, by Chet Ayla, who has an almost legendary reputation. And it's almost upsetting, I think, that this has become such a confrontational process. And I suspect it has been at times unpleasant for you, personally. Um, and yet, I can't help but feel that there was no way to avoid it, given how this whole process has come about. And I have to echo the disappointment uh, of so many people who testified. First, that this hearing is being held at a time when most members of the public are able to attend, and it's only being held here in Oahu. Um, Act 55 was passed, as we all know by now, by the legislature in a pretty murky process. Uh, it was very close to being a gut and replace bill by the time the last elements of it were added. Um, and I believe this flawed process by which the PLBC came into being placed on you, on you members of the board, an even greater burden to ensure that there was an open and transparent public process in establishing its rules. Um, the public opposition to the current draft has been voiced 
clearly in the first round of sharing that were held here and on the neighbor islands. But I think it feels to many people that you failed to heed the voices. Um, and this lack of responsiveness can't help but cause people to fear what the board will be doing going forward. I don't know that people individually think that you, Mr. Director, or Chair Ch Ayla, have bad intentions. But we're not responding to you as individuals with your, your history of environmental action. We're responding to you as members of a board that's been created by the legislature, which doesn't have enough rules to ensure that the public's interests are being protected. Um, indeed, like many of the volunteers at the Sierra Club, I didn't originally intend to oppose the PLDC outright. We understand the need to raise money for many of the good things that the DLNR does, such as protecting conservation watersheds, which are woefully underfunded. As you know, in the last session of the legislature, we did our best to help try to raise funds for that good work that you guys do. We understand the need to invest in improving public facilities, uh, such as the Alawai Harbor, which is what we were originally told Act 55 is all, all about. And so, through our director, Robert Harris, in the first round of hearings, we actually testified not for the abolition of the PLC, but for amended rules. And Robert Harris's testimony was echoed by dozens of other experts who specifically called out rules that could be changed and amended to give us the confidence that this actually would be something to the benefit of the public, not that something that would work to our detriment. But it appears as if you've chosen to ignore all of those testimonials. What was it that we were asking for? We asked for rules that would ensure that the PLDC would not be able to authorize development without any substantive criteria that protect, protects natural and cultural resources. We asked that proposed projects be required to establish that there isn't significant harm to natural resources and that there will still be public access. What's wrong? with what we were asking for. We asked for rules to ensure that the PLDC wouldn't be able to authorize development <coughs> in the conservation district, or along our shorelines, or on important agricultural lands. Aren't conservation lands, by definition, <coughs> supposed to be protected? Shouldn't ag land be used for agriculture? Our coastlines are particularly fragile, which is why we passed the Coastal Zone Management Act. Shouldn't the PLDC be required to follow the directives of the law instead of being exempted from the law? We asked for rules to ensure that the PLDC should not be allowed exemptions from the law that would allow it to do business with the developers that have, have environmental and labor law violations in their past. These are reasonable concerns, and your failure to incorporate them into your rules is what is leading to an ever louder and stronger campaign to abolish the PLDC. And in conclusion, if I may, it's the failure to do anything, to amend these draft rules, to acknowledge the hundreds of pieces of testimony you have received, both in writing and in person, that leads so many to fear that it's the democratic process itself that's being subverted. And that makes many people feel that in some ways you're just going through the motions, that you're sitting here hour after hour listening to this stuff, but it's kind of going in one ear and out the other. Um, I, for one, cho choose not to believe that you are just going through the motions. But I appeal to you to prove it by radically revising these rules. And if you don't, then I think what will happen is that there will be an ever louder and stronger public campaign to abolish the PLDC altogether. Thank you very much. Michael?
Kingdom and coordinated Earth Day on Kauai Island for seven years. I also now support the Occupy Honolulu. Um, I'm opposed to the Public Land Development Corporation. I believe the injustices and devastation projected by the, the establishment and agenda of the PLC must stop immediately. I'm referring to its role in wrongfully controlling and its wasteful development of property across Hawaii. Act 55 mandating PLC must be repealed. The issues have created such concern that proper hearings with proper notice given to people and at proper times and places so the public can attend must be arranged in all Ireland. We are not Russia, we are not China. I heard it said in the previous testimony. Well, in an anti-democratic way of globalization, yes, we are. Hawaiians, Russians, Chinese, U.S. residents have no um, have to change that. We have to stand up for a real democracy, workers' rights, human rights, land rights. I know the. Occupy Wall Street movement is addressing that and needs support. 
corruption, lack of protest, destruction, confusion, and frustration should be no surprise to any of the people here, not even yourself, knowing that Hawaii is an occupied region. The moratorium on land development or controversial development projects must take place. It must take place in the light of the admission of guilt on the part of the USA in the overthrow of Queen Leopoldi in 1893. That admission of guilt is U.S. Joint Public Resolution, uh, sorry, U.S. Uh, joint Resolution Public Law 103150. It is backed up with overwhelming evidence under international law, that the government and subjects of the sovereign Hawaiian kingdom never relinquished their sovereignty. The nation still exists, but is impaired through the illegal occupation by, an imperial, by the imperial will of the USA. Public Law 103-150, signed by President Clinton in 1993, stipulates reconciliation. This must be done between the two parties, the two nations, the Kingdom of Hawaii and the USA, under international law. The current way of addressing reconciliations is grossly unsatisfactory and is still illegal. I'm referring there to the attempted deals between the State of Hawaii and OHA, Office of Hawaiian Affairs. This is not correct. It should not be lost on anyone that OHA is a state agency not an independent entity somehow representing the lineage of Hawaiian nationhood as it was working the day before January 17, 1893, when Queen Liliopolani was rightfully the monarch and head of state. And then I have two par I have three paragraphs. Mm -hmm. Quick. All right. Um, the, the, I will be submitting this in testimony. <coughs> I will appreciate you looking for it. Um, the uh, Hawaiian government and Crown Land is a shameful act of theft and confusion on the part of the USA. It goes back to Queen Liliokalani's day. It comes up under, up, up under every administration. Whether it's Cayetano, Lingle, Abercrombie, it doesn't matter if it, if it goes back into territorial days. Those are states are still in <coughs> question here, and PLC. PLDC is part of the instruments used to continue an illegal occupation, and I, I believe that you need to address that in your own souls, apart from anything else. All right, I'll just sum up. The world must know that Kanaka Maoli, as indigenous people here, and the multicultural uh, Kingdom of Hawaii are key in turning global destruction uh, uh, around and back into sustainability. PLUC is part of an imperial destruct, a destruction, a genre of colonialism that goes back one century. You are not about sustainability or child care or child future. We must reinstate Hawaiian law and ways. You are misled 